In this video, I'll be demonstrating how to use Blender to make this animation of text being carved into stone. I'll be using Blender version 2.75a. Let's start by creating a new project. So from the File menu, select New, and then click on Reload Startup File. Next, right-click on the cube to make sure that it's selected, and then delete it by pressing X. We're going to be using a carving tool that will carve out our text on the surface of a stone wall, so we need to create a path for the carving tool to follow. So let's first create some text that we can use as a template. So press Shift A and select Text. To make the text stand up, we'll rotate it on the X axis. So press R, then X, then 90, then Enter. To edit the text, press Tab to enter edit mode. Now use the backspace key to delete the text and enter in your own text. Then press Tab to return to object mode. Now pull the text to the back. Next, let's create a path for the carving tool to follow. To do this, we'll start by adding a mesh object. So press Shift A and select Mesh. It doesn't really matter which mesh object we select because we're going to delete it and replace it with a path. So I'll select the circle. Now press Tab to enter edit mode. Then press A once or twice until everything is selected. Then press X to delete and select vertices. Now press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. To make this easier, I'll also switch to orthographic view by pressing 5 on the number pad. I'll zoom in a little. Now make sure that the Vertex Select button is selected. Next, we're going to add a vertex below the B. To do this, hold the Control button and click the left mouse button at the spot where you want the vertex to be. These manipulator arrows are used to move things, but they can interfere with what we're going to be doing next. So to turn them off, click this button. This vertex that we added will be the starting position of our carving tool. Now we're going to trace over the letters by holding down the control key while left clicking to add more vertices. So we'll start in the bottom left corner, then add a vertice at the top, and multiple vertices around the curves. When the first letter is finished, continue with the next one. This will create edges between the letters, but we'll be moving these edges later so that they do not get carved into the stone wall. I'll speed up the video while I finish adding vertices. Now we're going to select all of the edges that connect the letters together, so click on the Edge Select button. Then right-click the first edge to select it. Then hold down the Shift key and right-click on all of the other edges that connect letters together to add them to the selection. Then press 3 on the number pad to switch to right side view. Then press E to extrude, drag the edges to the left by about 3 grid divisions, and click the left mouse button to complete the operation. If I rotate the view, you can see the faces that were added. Next we're going to delete the back edge of each of these faces. So right-click on the first back edge to select it. Then while holding down the Shift key, right-click on the other back edges to add them to the selection. Then press X to delete and select Edges. Since the path is now raised between the letters, the carving tool that will be following the path will also rise up between the letters. Now we need to move the vertex at the start of the path. So click the Vertex Select button, and then right-click on the first vertex to select it. Then turn the manipulator back on by pressing this button. Now use the green arrow to drag the vertex to the front, and the blue arrow to drag it up. This will be the starting position of the carving tool. We're done with edit mode now, so press Tab to return to object mode. This object is currently a mesh, so we need to convert it to a path. To do that, press Alt-C and select Curve from Mesh Text. Now we're ready to add the carving tool that will follow this path. So press Shift A and select Mesh, and then Cone. This is the object that we'll be using to carve the text. Rotate it on the X axis by pressing R, then X, then minus 90, 
then Enter. Then scale it by pressing S, then point .15, then Enter. To make it follow the path, we need to add a constraint. To do that, click the Constraints button. Then click Add Object Constraint and select Follow Path. Then click in the Target Entry box and select the circle. This is the path that we created. Next, click the Animate Path button. This will initialize some settings for us. Now if you click the Play button on the timeline, you can see the carving tool follow the path. By default, the cone will start following the path at frame 1 and will continue following it for 100 frames. You can change the start frame by entering an offset value. I want it to start at frame 20. Since it currently starts at frame 1, I'll add an offset of 19. To change the number of frames that are used, right-click on the path to select it. Then click the Object Data button. This is where you set the number of frames that will be used. I'm going to set this value to 150. Now I'll set the frame number to 1 and press the Play button again. The cone now starts following the path at frame 20 and continues through frame 170. This is a good time to save what I have so far, so from the File menu, I'll select Save As. I'm going to name it Carve.Blend. Now let's create a stone wall, so press Shift A and select Mesh, and then Plane. Rotate it on the X axis by pressing R, then X, then 90, then Enter. Now scale it up in size by pressing S, then 2, then Enter. Now drag it back a little so that the path can be clearly seen. Then switch to front view by pressing 1 on the number pad. I'll also zoom out a little. Now drag the wall to center it behind the path. Next, let's add a material to the wall. So click on the Material button and then click New. Now come up here and change this from Blender Render to Cycles Render. Then click the Use Nodes button. We'll keep the Diffuse Surface Type. Next, click on the little button on the right side of the white color and select Image Texture. I'm going to be using this image. There's a link to it in the video description in case you want to use the same image. To select an image, click the Open button. Then navigate to the image that you want to use and select it. To make the image appear on the object, we need to UV unwrap the object, so press Tab to go into Edit Mode, and press A once or twice until everything is selected. Now press the U key and select Project from View Bounds. This will project the image onto the wall using our current view. If you click the Viewport Shading menu and select Material, you can see the image. We're going to be using dynamic paint for the carbon effect, and so we need to add more geometry to the wall for this to work properly. To add geometry, make sure the Tools tab is selected, and then click the Subdivide button. Set the number of cuts to 10. We're going to be subdividing this even further, but to avoid adding too much unnecessary geometry, we're only going to subdivide it in the areas that are close to the text. So press A to deselect everything, then press B for border select, and draw a selection box around the faces that are behind the text. Then press the subdivide button and set the number of cuts to 50. The higher this value is, the smoother the carving will look, but we want to avoid adding too much geometry. Now press Tab to return to object mode. Now let's position the wall so that the carving tool will carve at the correct depth. So press 3 on the number pad to switch to right side view. Since the cone lifts up in between letters, we need to make sure that we're not in between any letters right now. So since the path ends at frame 170, make sure that the current frame number is greater than 170. Now drag the wall until it's at the center of the cone. This is what it should look like so far. Now let's set up dynamic paint to create the carve-in effect. To use dynamic paint, objects are set up as brushes and canvases. In our case, the cone will be a brush and the wall will be a canvas. Let's set up the cone first, so right-click on it to select it. Then click on the Physics button. 
you may need to resize this panel to bring the Physics button into view. Now click on the Dynamic Paint button. Then click the Brush button, and then click Add Brush. We'll keep all of the default values. Now let's set up the wall. So right click on it to select it, and then click the Dynamic Paint button. Make sure the Canvas button is selected, and click Add Canvas. These values set the start and end frames that will be used for the dynamic paint. The carving will run through frame 170, so set the end value to 170. Then set the number of sub-steps to 20. This will add extra samples that will make the carving look smoother. Next, go down to the Dynamic Paint Advanced section. There are different surface types that can be selected. I'm going to select Displace, which will give us a carving effect. We can also set a Displace Factor value, which controls how deep the carving will be. Set this value to 2. Now let's try it out. This will be easier to see if we switch to Solid View. Now set the frame number to 1 and press the Play button. The cone will carve out the text and lift up in between letters. I'll speed up the video now until this is finished. The letters will be engraved on the front of the wall, and they will be raised on the back of the wall. If this happens to be backwards on your wall, then change the displace factor to minus 2. This will reverse which side of the wall is engraved and which side is raised. Now let's set up the chipping effect. We'll do this by adding a particle system to the cone to create some stone chips. The stone chips will be coming from the cone, but it will look like they are coming from the engraving in the wall. So let's start by pressing 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. Now right click on the cone to select it, then click on the particles button, and then click the new button. The stone chips are going to be particles, and these values control when the particles start to appear and when they end. Since the carving starts at frame 20 and runs through frame 170, change these values to 20 and 170. This value controls the number of particles that are created. I'm using a thousand particles for each letter, so I'm going to set this to 7,000. This value controls how long the particles will last, and so I'm going to set it to 1,000 to make sure that they last throughout the entire animation. Next, come down to the Render section and click on the Object button. This lets us define our own object that we can use for the particles. So let's add a cube and then modify its shape a little. I'll zoom out for this. To add the cube, left click on the empty area on the side of the wall to move the 3D cursor. Then press Shift A and select Mesh, and then Cube. Then press Tab to enter edit mode. Then right click on a corner to select it. Then drag it to the left and then up. Then rotate it to the back. Right click on another corner and drag it to the left and then up. Now press Tab to return to object mode. This is what our modified cube looks like. Next, let's set the material for the modified cube. So click on the Material button and then click the New button. We'll keep the default diffuse surface. Now click on the white color. The image that I'm using on the wall is a gray color. So I'm going to set this to a gray color. Now let's finish the particle setup. So press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. I'm going to zoom back in again also. Then right click on the cone to select it, and then click the particles button. Then click in this entry box and select the cube that we just created. Now our modified cube will be used for the stone chips. This value will set the size of the stone chips. Set it to 0 0.02. Then set the random size value to 1, which will make our stone chips multiple sizes. Now remove the check mark that's next to emitter. This will make the cone invisible when the animation is rendered. Next, come up here and open the rotation section. Put a check mark next to rotation and set this random value to 2. This will rotate the stone chips. Now let's play the animation to see how it's looking. So I'll set the frame number to 1 and press the play button.
This is looking good. The wall is being carved and we're generating stone chips. I'll speed up the video now until this finishes. I'm going to save what I have so far. Now let's set up the lighting. So press 3 on the number pad to switch to right side view and zoom out. Then right click on the lamp to select it and drag it over here to the left. Next, click on the object data button. Make sure the point lamp is selected and then set the size to 3. Now click on the Use Nodes button and set the Strength value to 5000. Now let's set up the camera view. So press 0 on the number pad. This is the view looking through the camera. I'll zoom in a little. Next, we'll lock the camera to the view. To do that, press N to open the Properties panel and put a check mark next to Lock Camera to View. Then press N again to close the Properties panel. Now I can zoom, pan, and rotate while looking through the camera. So now I'll set the view that I want to use. To see what this looks like so far, click on the Viewport Shading menu and select Rendered. Next, let's add some texture to the wall. We'll do this by adding a displacement to the material which will give the appearance of depth. So right click on the wall to select it. Then click the Screen Layout button and select Compositing. Then click the Shader Nodes button. This node represents the image and I'm going to use the color output for the displacement. Now return to the default screen layout. The lighter areas of the image now appear raised and the darker areas appear lowered. Now we're ready to set things up to render the animation. These values set the start and end frames for the animation. The carving runs through frame 170, so let's set the end of the animation to 200. Now click on the Render button. Then open the Sampling section. You can increase the Render Samples value to produce a higher quality animation, but it will increase the render time. I'm going to leave it set to 10 to help minimize the rendering time. Now come up to the Output section. This is where you set the directory where your animation will be saved. Click on this button and select a directory. Next, click here to set the file format. There are multiple movie formats that you can choose from. I'm going to use OGG Theora. Now we're ready to render the animation, but I'm going to save the project first. It's a good idea to save the project before rendering in case something goes wrong during the rendering process. To render the animation, click on the Animation button. If you want to abort the rendering process before it's done, you can press the Escape key, or you can click the X next to the Render Progress bar. Since this is going to take a while, I'm going to pause the video until it's done. The animation is done rendering now. It took my computer about 12 minutes to render. This is the final frame that was rendered. If you want to return to the previous view, you can click this button and select 3D View. To view the animation, go to the Render menu and click on Play Rendered Animation. Or you can press Ctrl F11. The animation will play through to the end and then start back at the beginning again. Now if you open up Windows File Explorer or something equivalent, you can navigate to your movie file. Now assuming that you have a video player that will play the video format that you specified, you can now play your video. I've set up this player to repeat the video in a loop so that it will keep playing. Well that concludes this video. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe and leave a comment.